This program has been produced to explain the instructions for train braking in snow conditions. These instructions can be found in clauses 512 and 612 of the rule book, appendix number 6. The working instructions for class 253 and 254 HSTs and for DC EMUs in the rail track south zone and southwest zone sectional appendices. We hope that the following information will assist you in the development of your skill and judgment when breaking in snow. In this program we'll look at the background of the current instructions for running brake tests when snow is falling or is being disturbed by the passage of trains. Severe winter conditions occur relatively infrequently in Britain, maybe only once in a decade. Unlike our neighbours in Northern Europe and North America, this means we have more limited opportunities to use our experience of train handling in these severe conditions. The result has often been equipment failure and operating difficulties. One problem for train drivers has been that of reduced braking power in conditions of falling snow, or where snow has already fallen and is blown out by the passage of trains. This can cause clogging and freezing of the brake rigging and contact problems between the disc and pad on disc brakes. Both traction and braking adhesion rely on clean, dry contact between the wheel and the rail. In the same way, braking efficiency relies on the same conditions of contact between the friction material and the tyre or disc. On disc brake trains, whether wheel-mounted discs or inboard ventilated discs, melting snow can form a film of water on the face of the disc which can influence brake power, particularly under light applications. This situation doesn't occur on tread brakes as the tyre makes contact with the rail as well as the highly abrasive cast iron brake block. These problems were first addressed in the 1970s, in the early days of disc brakes. Drivers were instructed to carry out frequent running brake tests, making a light initial service application of the brake to condition the discs and pads and to maintain free movement of the brake rigging. Since the 1970s, research and development has steadily improved the performance of the friction material. At the same time, research has revealed some particular problems where snow comes into contact with the disc brakes. The key to understanding this lowering of brake efficiency in snow conditions is to make a comparison with the tyres of a car on a wet road surface. Where there is sufficient water laying on the tarmac, the tread pattern of the tyre will be unable to dissipate the water and the tyre will start to lose vital contact with the road. We all know this phenomenon as aquaplaning. Adhesion is lost and a dangerous situation rapidly develops. In this case, the remedy is to slow down. We cannot dissipate the water by increasing the weight on each tyre, so the volume of water each tyre must deal with is lessened by reduction in speed. The particular properties of swirling snow create the same conditions between the disc and the brake pad. A film of water builds up. When the brake is applied, the pad aquaplanes on the disc surface. But now we have a different solution. We can increase the pressure of the pad on the disc. Let's take a closer look at the brake pad. The friction material must meet the stringent BR569 specification, giving an acceptable retardation performance without causing excessive wear. All friction materials are service tested for a period of 12 to 18 months. The shape of the friction material is critical as well as the groove pattern. These groove patterns may be likened to the tread pattern of a car tyre. They serve to make the friction pad flexible enough to ensure total contact with the disc and to dissipate any water from the disc surface. The force with which the pad is applied to the disc is called the brake clamp load and this load is vital to the clearance of water between disc and pad. The specification for friction material also incorporates dry to wet frictional relationship. We can see from the graphic how the gap between the lower wet friction curve and the upper dry friction curve narrows as the brake clamp load is increased. Let's have a look at another example. If you drive your car through a body of water, say a flood or a ford, a light normal application of the foot brake will immediately demonstrate a severe loss of brake power.
To clear the water from the disc, it is necessary to make a heavy application, in other words, to exert a high brake clamp load. The friction pads have now been able to clear the water and the brake, once again, works efficiently. In falling or swirling snow conditions, research has shown that frequent full-service brake applications are necessary to dissipate the water from the disc and keep the brakes in an efficient condition. The previous instruction to make frequent light or initial brake applications has been shown to be inadequate. Quite simply, the brake clamp load was insufficient to clear the water and condition the brake. Let's have a look at some test data to illustrate the point. In the first example, the driver made an initial application as a running brake test. In the following full-service braking, the stopping time and distance was considerably extended. The brakes were still aquaplaning. In this condition, the brake power can be severely impaired. In the second example, the driver made a full-service brake application as his running brake test. In the following service stop, the braking time and distance was greatly reduced. The brake power was greater, there was no aquaplaning. So what's the message? In snow conditions, carry out a running brake test every three to five minutes. Put the brake in full service and leave it until you can feel a good, normal rate of retardation, reducing the train speed by at least 10 miles per hour. You have now cleared the water from the discs and conditioned the brake. In service stops to stations or signals at danger, or in slowdowns to speed restrictions, brake earlier than usual and always start with a full service application, then reduce the braking as required. Be especially careful when approaching buffer stops. Locomotive hauled trains comprised of Mark III or Mark IV coaches, as well as HSTs, must be restricted to a maximum of 100 miles per hour and all trains which include disc braked vehicles must be limited to a speed 10 miles per hour below the normal maximum for the line in question. However, this reduction does not apply below 50 miles per hour. Of course, when driving many classes of train, you'll be slowing down or stopping every two or three minutes anyway. Always get the measure of available brake power in good time and use that measure in making your judgment of stopping distances. EMU trains equipped with dynamic brakes on power car axles will have this dynamic brake isolated by the engineer during snow risk periods. This ensures that all discs are properly conditioned at each running brake test and during normal service braking. Remember that in all hazardous conditions safety takes priority over punctuality. The vital braking techniques outlined in this film and the instructions laid down in the latest publications are designed to help you deal safely and effectively with severe and abnormal conditions and to give you essential confidence in the brake equipment when the going is tough. Where snow is falling or is disturbed by the passage of trains, carry out frequent running brake tests every three to five minutes. Do so by making a full service application and reducing the train speed by at least 10 miles per hour. Brake earlier. Remember, safety before punctuality.